Hello, um, welcome. I'm going to switch you to gallery view now, Tim. Welcome to uh, uh, another episode of the Zodcast, um, which is a name I'm currently uh, furiously fighting a rearguard action on, <laughs> copyright terms. Um, a Zoom podcast with uh, my dear friend, a colleague, and uh, an economic expert, uh, Tim Harford, who's got a new book to promote. And is a great oh, yeah. Do I uh, wave it around? Please hold it right up there. And I'm pleased to see it's not in reverse. That's good. That's very clever. So yeah. Tim Harford, the next 50 things that made the modern economy. Um, we should probably explain that title. It's, it's, a, it's a sequence of books you're developing. You've already done the first 50 things. Yeah, secret. I mean, if two is a sequence, then then yes. So I, I, did, uh, I did a BBC radio series and then book called 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy. And uh, so good, they wanted another 50 things, which, of course, then produced all the usual agonizing over the title and in the end yeah. of the next 50 things that made the modern economy. The next really refers to the book rather than to the 50 things. But um, anyway, I think it's once, you, it's once you've got a winning model, stuff. you you stick with it, don't you? That seems to be the rule in publishing, you know, Tim Harford <laughs> and the 50 things that made, that would be the ideal way to go with it, I would imagine. Yes, a winning, a winning model sounds good. Yes, yeah. I'd like some of them. You want seven uh, installments, ideally, before Tim Harford finally grows up. Yes, and, uh, yes. We explain the little uh, star-shaped scar on your forehead and all the rest of it. But is it, so is it a, a BBC, do the BBC kind of prompt you? Are you? Do you think of yourself as a BBC entity to some extent? Because you've got quite a strong profile there, but also the FT. I have. I mean, I, mean, I am employed by the FT. The very first sort of bit of, bit of communications, economic communication I did was, was a book called The Undercover Economist. Everything right. else followed from that. Yes. But I, I have done a lot of stuff for the, for the BBC, so there's more or less, which is now uh, apparently prime time. It's in the same slot as, um, as, I think, Desert Island Discs and In Our Time and things like that, wow. nine o'clock in the morning. Yes. Um, so with the, 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 the big boys there and um, uh, 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy. And there, was, there were a few series of a, what was that comedy show? Um, Simon, Simon Evans, Evans rabbits on market. and off. Yes, that's the one. I'm impressed with your with your times. assertion that you've got the, the the prime time slot with more or less whose entire raison d'etre is to, of course, analyse claims like that to see whether they stand up to scrutiny. Well, we can we can claim whatever we want because we're, <laughs> we're judge, jury, and executioner. Yes, nobody will be able to dispute it. To be in the same time slot as in our time is kind of ironic I suppose it's in their time isn't it but it's quite it is a very sick you have to work hard to keep because I have found myself nodding off during in our time with the absolute best will in the world it's a <laughs> dense dense presentation of facts isn't it it's extraordinary how I, I don't know whether you watch like documentaries like Horizon and stuff on the BBC t television I'm, I'm, I'm more of a radio man to be honest so I mean in our time is is but it does uh, what, what, I'm what I'm spinning off here time. is, with, I just want to get the, what I almost struck with, with, with other documentaries on BBC Radio, what television is, I always feel there aren't enough facts, there's not enough information, I'm always like, come on, get some, there's lots of like, sunsets over Jodrell Bank, you know, when I want to know how, how many exoplanets we've discovered or whatever. But within yeah, our time, time for all of it. it's yeah. just so dead, it's like a cluster, yes, you can't, but yes, what's go? what were you going to say? Well, what I, what I love about In Our Time is that if it's something like, oh, um, Tang Dynasty mm. pottery... Tang dysentery. <laughs> Melvin will always begin with, well, as uh, of course everybody knows, the yes. Tang Dynasty began in the 14th century. And just, yes. just, and you're just like, I'm completely lost. But if it's math, she's like, well, uh, some boffins have got something to do with numbers. I don't know. Uh, over to you, Marcus de Sotoy. And he's just, he just shrugs and... and it's, this is clearly incomprehensible to anybody. It's into it the anti mass snobbery, thing. you think? There's, is that a BBC thing or is that like a worldwide thing that BBC, the, 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 the maths is perceived to be just the realm of boffins? It, yeah, well, it goes right back to C.P. Snow um, or, uh, or Sir Charles Snow to his friends, as I think Michael Flanders once joked. C.P. Snow, <laughs> who wrote this f famous essay, The Two Cultures, and he complained about the fact that you. You, know, you could quite happily boast about knowing nothing about the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah. Um, you would be humiliated to to boast that you'd never read a, 
a work of Shakespeare. Uh, and the serious thing about that essay, which was lamenting this division between the arts and the scientists, were, uh, the, the sciences, was that um, actually I think C.P. Snow had a really serious point in mind, which was that, um, and this is eerily relevant, um, Charles Lindemann, Winston Churchill's friend and close advisor, had, had advocated carpet bombing German cities on the basis of of, I think, very, very thin scientific evidence. But there was simply nobody in the Churchill government who, with any kind of now said numeracy to question him. I can't imagine and, what analogy you might be about to draw here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but, you know, well, <laughs> uh, that people leap, jump to their own conclusions. But, but what Snow was basically saying is you've got a lot of smart people in government mm. and you've got this one scientific advisor, um, but nobody else knew anything about science and so no one was able to challenge him. And so it wasn't just, oh, all you arts people yeah, should, yeah. should trust the scientists. It's more a case of, you know, enough people need to be informed about science and maths to be able to have a, a proper debate. Well, you know the ironic thing, and I'm sure you do know the ironic thing about the last couple of weeks from that point of view, is that the one champion of that attitude and that uh, perspective is Dominic Cummings. That is his entire raison d'etre. That was his purpose, his, his mission statement for getting into the walls of power, the halls of power corridors of power, isn't it? Not halls of the uh, back rooms of power, uh, the smoke-filled horse trading of power. He, he wanted to uh, expand the range of options from which uh, a prime minister might recruit a cabinet, essentially. He said that the kind of people who become MPs tend to come from quite a specific and narrow, in his view, not particularly appealing, but, but regardless of whether you like them or not, they are unquestionably sorry, just turning off mailbox, unquestionably quite a narrow range of individuals who tend to have a set of skills which help them to become members of parliament. They're good at yeah. the MPs, they're quite good at self-promotion, they've mastered Twitter or whatever. They don't tend to be STEM, they don't tend to be uh, have any experience of running a multi-billion dollar corporation or even a sizable department in a, in a large academic institution, you know, which are the kind of things that you might then suddenly go, yeah, let's run defense, you know, and they have no idea what they're, what they're doing. And of course, yeah. they've come for him with their knives, in my view. Yes, I, although I don't, I don't think they've, I don't think they've come for him with their knives because of because of that specifically. But I suppose it, reasonable it's, people it's, could differ. It's but. part of it's part of it, the hostility he's already shown to the establishment. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I don't know that the backbenchers of the Tory Party have, are, are as likely to come to his aid as they might do for, for you know a more Victoria Wood type candidate who had been to, to the Barnard Castle. That's all my. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I think Fry's point is exactly right. Anyway, sorry, Snow was it Snow or Fry? Snow. Snow. It was snow. snow. No. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's important. It's not that, that everybody should be a mathematician or that everyone should be a statistician or a chemist or whatever, but you just need that diversity yeah. of views and you need enough of a, of a common language for people to be able to discuss with each other rather than just shrugging their shoulders and going, well, I don't know. It's all gibberish one of the things that you uh, brought up in one of your uh, book, three books back, I think, was Messy, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about the uh, the uh, Barcelona striker, which was a bit of a departure for you. In fact. <laughs> but no, it wasn't. It was about Messi with the white, and it was it was at how we can benefit from initial conditions that are sometimes rather unprepossessing or uninspiring or, or even alarming in there, the confusion and chaotic sort of uh, mess that you might confront. And, and one of those things is was the first, I think, really calm um, and sensible and, and well explained demonstration of the benefits of diversity that I'd seen because diversity has become a something of a sort of mantra that you simply have to you're expected to support for its own sake in all sorts of situations now politically especially but you explained I'll let you do it again in your own words but why diversity can work and in this particular instance well, I think that the, the simplest analogy is is just imagine a toolbox and uh, you want you want a range of tools. You don't want, let's say you think that, that screwdrivers are just the best tool, just objectively the best tool. And let's I mean, say you're right. There is something to that. Yeah. <laughs> let's say screwdrivers really are the best tool. The, the cross and, and, let's say, really, yeah. and let's say you've just got the very best screwdrivers around. And then, But even so, your toolbox is going to be better with hammers and chisels and, and 
all of these and spanners and pliers and and I mean I mean I'm not a yeah I'm not really good but, with my hands. No, but I mean believe me, you're in safe hands here in terms of toolbox <laughs> competence and then snobbery. But what I liked about your explanation was you went beyond that. You gave an example of a group of people who might be homogenous in some sense. Let's say all 40-year-old men, all white, all university educated, working on a problem together as some sort of team Sound chaps. exercise. Sound chaps. And then you have another group in which you have four 40-year-old white men, university educated, and then a couple of young Asian women who are, uh, who's, maybe whose English isn't even that brilliant, and they're in the group as well. And suddenly the group it starts to feel much less certain of its of its progress. It feels much less confident about the uh, solutions it's coming up yep. with. And yet, remarkably, when it comes to it, at the end of the day, far more often they reach workable solutions more quickly and more reliably than the than the homogenous group. For yeah, reasons and that are directly to do with that diversity. Absolutely, and there are there are a couple of of really nice psychological experiments relevant to that. Um, one is the very famous. Um, Solomon Ash conformity experiments where he mm. he basically uh, got people to say weird things um, simply because they were surrounded by other people who were also who were saying the wrong thing and all saying the wrong thing and he could get people to say the wrong thing as long as everyone else around them was in agreement but the moment there was a disagreement uh, people would would actually start reverting to their own personal views and their own personal yes. judgments so yes. simply the fact that people in the group were disagreeing with each other was productive because then people said well if, if you guys can't agree then i suppose my view is also important whereas if, if everyone's in agreement i'm just going to fall in it's that and, classic and, thing with yeah. line lengths of line on a board isn't it where that's a, the one. a dozen that's people one. will will deliberately tell lies the, the 13th person will just fall in line but as soon as the yeah. others break rank it's a fascinating aspect of humanity and I, i've wondered sometimes whether it is connected with uh, I, most people would think of as a different aspect of humanity but they share something which is the sort of psychological barrier, uh, for instance, the four minute mile, which for a long time was presented as though it had some sort of, I mean, four minutes is clearly an arbitrary, you know, and a mile is an arbitrary unit. And yet somehow it had been perceived as though it were almost going to be like crossing the streams as if God would be displeased at this sort of challenge to his, to the, you know, the rules of his universe. And as soon as Bannister broke it, it, it was it was regularly broken over the course of the next few years. It became it sort of disappeared in the rearview mirror in, in sort of well, serious running. Actually, we we covered this on more or less once. You, you, your heart is now sinking, Simon. <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't imagine out, I had discovered a new paradigm. But go ahead. Well, no, so it turns out I think this um, Tony Martin. I think uh, Tony Martin awakened the giant within. Tony Robbins. Um, yeah, well, you, Tony, Tony Martin was the, the farmer who shot a, a young lad in the back. <laughs> found details, <him> details. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony Robbins, yes. Awake of the Giant Within, I think, made a big play of this. Yeah. And I mean, certainly it's true, Bannister broke the record and then the, the record was subsequently broken. Um, but it wasn't as though there was some dramatic shift. Sure, uh, well, right, I, actually, okay. I actually interviewed Sir Roger before he, before he died, for yeah. more or less, and, and one of the points he made was that he, um, the people who were coming close to breaking that record, their training, their nutrition uh, was disrupted by the war. So there was a, there was a real, and, and I think some yeah. of the Norwegians were we're getting close, but they all went pro. Well, is that funny? Because I, I only just finished reading uh, a book called The Worst Journey in the World, which was written by Apsley uh, Cherry Gerard, one of Scott's men in the Antarctic on the, the final, the Terra Nova expedition, which obviously uh, ended badly for Scott and his men. He was on one of the other parties, obviously, and came back and wrote his book about it. And, um, you know, it feels more, I mean, it's interesting that you compare them to the Norwegians. It was like a kind of, there was that a singularity of approach from the Norwegians, whereas part of the reason that Scott ended up dead was probably because he was trying to combine a scientific uh, intelligence gathering operation with an attempt on the pole. In fact, to him, the attempt to re be the first to reach due south was was almost incidental to the present. It was more of a uh, it was more of a would you call it a sponsorship a sponsor pleasing yeah. kind of exercise in order to get money. But it, it, the first thing I looked up after reading it, thinking I want more of this, was Bannister. It was right. the first book I went to. It's why it was in my mind because I thought, I mean, I enjoy these kind of races to try and beat, make, you know, in that kind of black and white footage kind of era. But you know, there is the most extraordinary uh, little tidbit in in that book, the worst journey in the world, yeah. uh, where um, it's kind of mentioned that they were still arguing over whether uh, 
whether vitamin C, well, yes, basically, whether scurvy, lemon yeah. prevented scurvy. And, and it was the considered opinion of the Navy surgeon on one of these early Antarctic expeditions that that wasn't the answer. Mm. And that, that's, that's really astonishing because we're all told, you know, in Nerdland, we're all told that James Lind um, basically nailed this in um, the 1700s. Yeah. That he discovered that, Cook, I mean, took, we didn't know what took limes, vitamin C. Didn't that was why they were called limeys, right? Yeah, uh, yes. So it yeah. began with lemons. And so, so Lind was using Sicilian lemons and he discovered in a sort of slightly shonky trial that he didn't really fully understand. But he basically demonstrated if you give people lemon juice, they recover from scurvy. And if you give them these various other treatments that people yeah. have suggested, like um, sulfuric acid, well, I mean, it's acidic, like lemon juice, so maybe it's the acid, but no. He gave them these other treatments that didn't work. Um, but then the, the British Navy managed to forget this fact. Mm. And, and 200 years later, they still didn't know it. Yeah. And it was partly that they'd shifted from lemons to limes, and actually limes don't have as much vitamin C. Ah, right. It was partly that they were storing the lime juice in copper vessels and copper breaks down vitamin C. Copper breaks was, down coronavirus as well, apparently. Do you know that? Uh, apparently so. Yeah, um, oh, I'm not an epidemiologist. <laughs> and, um, but, but also it was that because of steamships, people were just getting scurvy less often anyway. Right. And so there was just this, there was this genuine doubt as to whether this, this cure, lime juice, yeah. it didn't really seem to make any difference. And so this incredibly important, and you would have thought fairly simple fact, yeah. was discovered and forgotten, and actually discovered multiple times and forgotten multiple times. Some, there's some deep lesson there, I think. There it is, absolutely. It's the, well, it's the dark ages in miniature, isn't it? All the, all the learning yeah. that, that can be lost in a single fire. What, what, they didn't know about vitamins as such at that point, did they? they it was more, this, this works, let's just keep using this. I don't think they had quite the, what are the vital minerals, I suppose, vitamins are, aren't they? It's a fun, one of those yeah. funny words that when you think about it, 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 it sounds as if it's saying more than it, more than it is. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, vitamins are just as kind of useful chemicals, aren't they? And they're yeah. all kinds of different things. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, so they, they didn't know exactly quite what Quite a it gradual was. process, exactly, but yeah. I, think, I mean, so so much of what we, of what, you know, of medicine even today is, um, we, you know, this is a drug that we think we have some reasons to think might work. Let's try. Yeah. I mean, you see it with the coronavirus trials. There's so do much we, that we still don't understand. Do we know why uh, Inuit people, if, if that's the correct term currently, uh, don't get scurvy? I don't think they have access to citric fruit. Um, well, so vitamin C is present in, well, I've, I'm really going way outside my economic yes. competence. But, oh, this is um, great. <laughs> You're striking but, but out. A, so vitamin C is present in, in quite a lot of uh, different foods. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yes, so I'm is guessing it, that... This is the thing I think, it, is it, it's how long it lasts in certain foods. So for lemons, you can take them on ship and they'll last for months. I think it might be in meat if you, if you cook it fresh. I think it might just be that it doesn't survive salting and storage possibly for very long. That's, that sounds plausible. And it's really just the two of us on this conversation. So yeah. no one's going to contradict us. What I like about these conversations is when someone's outside their comfort zone, it's that you're being forced. You see, this is like a messy and messy experience for you now. And even though you're dealing Keith Jarrett-like with an un playable piano of an interview yeah. you're being forced well, I, didn't, to respond I didn't to think we were we were to go to to roger bannister and then to vitamin c but we yeah. but you know that's, that's let's kind of steer fun. it back briefly though to your your new book so it's it's 50 do i, do I wave it around again yes it, I thoroughly the, approved the by the way is that, is that something else as long as it's in the background of the of, on the bookshelves okay. and that's clearly your reference library as well so that's very impressive <laughs> <laughs> all your dictionaries. You, you, you've um, highlighted three of them already on, on BBC uh, web pages that people can visit if they're interested. But there were a couple of... Um, so one of them that I was... That of the three that I was most interested in was uh, Teremin. I think, is it Louis Teremin or Leon Teremin? Is that Leon Teremin, yes. Yeah. Right? I think Teremin, but... Um... I mean, it's a funny because he lived in Russia, but he's a Huguenot, French Huguenot and German extraction born in the very it? end of the, of the um, Romanov dynasty. Well, 1898. I looked him up on Wikipedia just before I did this because he was it immediately... You do, your, you do your homework, Simon. So often, when, when we were working together on Simon Evans Goes to Market, what I really enjoyed is that you did all the hard um, economic <laughs> history work and everyone just assumed that all that, all you, that stuff was coming You were just there to me. lend credibility to it, <laughs> as if I got really wild. And I think it's fair to say, Tim, isn't it, that it's the Germans' fault and you just have to nod because it's the script. 
<laughs> exactly so. But it, not, not the Germans fault, actually. That I'm, I've always been uh, overwhelmingly impressed by by German innovation. And uh, there's a, there's a whole book I mean to read it one day called The German Genius, which uh, a man called I think it's Peter Watson wrote about. Oh, that um, he's, he's written a whole books about the history of ideas and technology and so on. But that one particularly is an attempt to basically break through the, the the Second World War as the only thing that the British know or remember about Germany, you know, just like point to, the, you know, a century and a half of extraordinary innovation beforehand. Yeah. And Theremin, yeah. arguably, is part of that. He was born in St. Petersburg, but as I say, German extraction. You, we all associate him basically with Star Trek, right? The wow. Yeah, the wow. And, and, yeah. uh, and then Bill Bailey plays it. But it's, in fact, an extraordinary wealth of innovations, many of them under threat of death, it seems. Yes, well, he was, um, there, it's, it's slightly obscure what happened. He went from the US to the Soviet Union in the 30s, and his wife, uh, who's American, um, she African-American, in fact, uh, she said that he had been kidnapped. Um, but it, it's not entirely clear whether that's true or whether he went voluntarily. But in the end, he basically ended up uh, in a prison camp being ordered to invent uh, Cold War winning technology by Stalin on pain of death, um, which is, you know, very um, sort of the usual bracing uh, yeah. Soviet Union attitude to science. <laughs> um, there was quite did, a bit of he, that in, in the Second World War as well, wasn't there? I believe, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, it, but he, he, one of the things that he invented was... Um, was well i should tell the story from the point of view of the of the american ambassador yes. avril yes. harriman the thing, so avril, right? avril harriman was presented in august 1945 so the war in europe's over the powers are the great powers are sort of realigning themselves preparing for the post war uh, epoch and avril harriman the us ambassador to moscow is presented with this uh, giant wooden seal by base effectively the boy scouts of the soviet union yes. I, you should, I forget exactly you what clarify seal because of course having just uh, come back from the south wooden, pole we might be yes a wooden <laughs> seal a wooden seal like a crest um, a sort of heraldic thing almost exactly as a big yeah. big sort of di wooden disc with a with a, a relief eagle uh, yeah. on it and um it was so he was presented with this thing and rather beautiful and uh, he thought, well, uh, this is great. I'll hang it up in my office. But first, of course, I'll have it checked for bugs. It was checked over for bugs, and they basically said, well, this appears to be um, a solid wooden yeah. thing. And, no batteries, uh, and, no wires. What could you... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what, there is no... Even if there's something in it, no batteries, no wires, can't do any harm. And so he hung it up in his study. And some time later, British intelligence realized that uh, Avril Harriman's private conversations were being broadcast from the, the US Embassy. They could pick <laughs> them up on the radio. And um, so the Americans scanned everything. And there was, there's no radio transmitter. So very serious. And then the Americans um, figured out that there were radio broadcasts as well. And no one could work out what was going on and it turned out in the end that it was the thing and inside the thing there's a very simple silver membrane uh, and, and a little echo chamber so that served as a microphone and there was a radio antenna and that was it there was no there were no electronics and there, there was there was no battery and there, were, there was no power source and the if you broadcast a reasonably powerful radio signal at it that antenna would broadcast back in sympathy and it would broadcast and it would be picking up uh, whatever the microphone and did it have was to detecting. Be, did the signal you broadcast at it have to be at a particular wavelength to which it was tuned or was it uh, bombarding I, it? Well, I'm outside my comfort zone again, okay, uh, Simon, right, but yeah. I, pres I presume so. That, that, but basically the Soviets, the Soviets could do this. So whenever they wanted it to broadcast to them, all they had to do was broadcast at it. Um, and uh, so this was invented by Theremin. It was a very successful bug. It was eventually kind of unveiled in a big set piece at the United Nations saying, look, you know, look at what the Soviets did. Um, yeah. And, um, but the, the, the reason why it's in the book, the next 50 things that made the modern economy is because it, it's the basic technology behind the RFID chip, which again is a passive antenna with a simple uh, bit of 
uh, data encoded, yeah. no battery needed, and you broadcast a radio signal at it, and it pings a little radio signal back. What we call a and smart card usually now, or something like that. Yes, yes, you, yeah. it, you, so you can have it in, in phones and smart cards. That's a particular kind of RFID chip yeah. uh, for what's called near-field communication. Right. Um, but you can have them in library books, you can have them in, um, in tags on clothes. And they were first used in aeroplanes, those are big old things in aeroplanes. Um, you can have them in, in earrings that you tag to the uh, ears of cows. Uh, and it's like a barcode, but um, there's more data and it, it's quicker to read. Yes. Uh, you could just sort of walk through a scanner and it, and it picks up. Um, but the, the reason I was fascinated by it is because it's, it is still basically a very, very cheap, simple invention. Yeah. And for all the talk of the Internet of Things, where you've got all these smart devices that are, you know, they have their own IP addresses and they have all, you know, they've got batteries and smartphones and all of this stuff. Um, there is a real power in something being incredibly cheap. So you can tag yeah. every single shampoo bottle or book. Things or that you can bounce other things off. They've been quite a yeah. big story, haven't they? I, I remember we talked at one point, I can't remember what we brought it in in relation to, but the, the development of GPRS, which came from tracking the Sputnik. I believe and this was a yeah this was in one of your books because it was it was essentially a technology that was developed in coffee breaks while two sets of scientists I think MIT or somewhere were supposed to be working on something else but during their coffee breaks they found themselves repeatedly discussing the implications of Sputnik's signal as it passed over the, the globe yeah. And they yeah, they've, just they've triangulated. Yeah. yeah, they figured out that they could, they could figure out exactly where it was using the triangulation of signals. And then uh, somebody sort of thought, well, hang on a minute. Couldn't you that reverse that reverse? process? And yeah. If you've got two satellites up there, yeah. you could figure out where you are. Exactly. Um, yes. And that's fundamentally how GPS uh, and that, They was first used for submarines, I think, for US submarines to, to enable them to work out where they were because they were the ones that were struggling with that. Yeah, and now and now it's just used for. Yes. You know, well, we I went for a walk this morning with uh, with my family, and we were just finding our ways around um, you know around the the, the Chilterns, yes. sort, of, sort of footpaths across farms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, completely reliant on on GPS. It is it's fantastic in the countryside, isn't it? Yeah. I remember. I still remember very clearly the car I was in when I first saw GPRS working in real time. A Tom Tom, essentially uh, working in real time, and it was it was a, a cab that was taking me back from. I was working on the big breakfast as a writer, and so they'd get a car to bring you home. And I was just going around Kings Cross up York Way when I when I noticed this little sort of uh, illuminated panel stuck onto his windscreen and said, "What what's that?" And he goes, "Oh, that is sorcery. A, that is a sat nav." And I was like, yeah. "It was like so what that." Is that a, and I re, it, as it dawned on me just how accurately it had us on the map, it was it was one of those moments where your jaw just yeah. falls away, and then within a matter of weeks you completely accept this as the new normal, and you know you carry on in this absurd world that we now live in. But it is astonishing. There's a there's a, a lovely experiment that I. Uh, talk about in one of my cautionary tales podcasts um, which is to do with our dependence on GPS and what it does to us and in this experiment they got some people to to basically take a tour of a of a small Japanese city not not that far away from Tokyo mm. and some people were given a guided tour by a human some people were told to follow a route on a map and some people were given GPS with a, with sat nav directions and then when they got back the experimenters that said, uh, okay, off you go, <laughs> do it again. Yeah. This time, this time with no help. And they found that although the experience of go, sort of figuring it all out with a map or following a human guide, they're very, very different. Both of those groups of people got around just fine. I think the people who really had to figure it out on the map, they really knew where they were. Yeah. The people who were following a human guide, they had enough cognitive attention to really pay attention to what was going on. But the people in the, who'd followed the, the GPS, they were in this weird sort of uncanny valley. Yeah, but they, uh, they couldn't really take in their surroundings. And at the same time, they, they weren't really taking in the map. Yeah. And so they, they just got completely lost when they were asked to do it again. So we, we do become dependent on these devices. And if they fail, we're, we're in trouble. And I have a theory, which I mean, I've had for years, that, that the temptations of technology is, is that it, will, it makes you assume that everything that yours, anything that amounts to a chore can be pushed into the background, allowing you to do something that's fun or interesting in the foreground. So, for instance, you know, there was a time when... when uh, 
let's say doing the laundry was hard work and required you to concentrate on scrubbing and, and you know putting enough physical effort in that you're that you would as you probably know from various books like the thinking fast and slow if you if you use too much oxygen your brain is ceases to be able to solve problems and so on and it's just sort of <laughs> all the oxygen's going into your muscles you know yeah so and now you have uh, washing machines and that's quite easy you just stuff you make sure there isn't any fibers or keys in the pockets and then everything goes in and you put in a little pouch and click 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 and it's done but what happens is you then just start to layer things one on top of the other until you still have no nothing that you're really focused on or committed to or like engaged with in a meaningful way, you know. Yeah. In the same way that if I'm driving now and I don't really need to pay any attention to the road uh, as a from a navigational point of view because I've got the sat now, so I think oh I can listen to an audio book, but I can't really listen to that audio book properly. I can't pay it the sort of attention. If I do, I am likely to have an accident sooner or later. Yeah. So it's just it's kind of it's just a layer of sort of semi-engaged, not done properly exercises, you know. And I often think, I mean, it's, you can get useful information even half listening to an audio book. But I can't help wondering whether I wouldn't be sort of even improving myself in some meaningful way, or certainly having a more meaningful experience if I was mindfully engaged with the with the, with the road and the you know the challenges of getting to somewhere. You're sounding so progressive there, Simon. It's not like you, but <laughs> no, I think. I think you're right. And I, I find, I, I love to walk around listening to podcasts. I've got loads of, I'm a real podcast fan. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do realize that I miss, I gain a lot from that, but I yeah. also miss the remarkable power of just walking around, not listening to podcasts. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. there, there's really something quite magical about doing that and having um, your sort of, the, your brain is being a little bit stimulated by the fact that you, the, your environment is constantly changing yeah. and and you can really get your your sort of creative juices flowing and then yes. so sometimes now i i deliberately don't listen to the podcast even though i, mean, I want to listen to the podcast do you ever, i don't to, know whether you've tried this or whether it, i had noticed some podcasts and also some audio books i bought with the best of intention or downloaded but they have proved to be quite dull so actually, I quite like walking with those on because my mind switches off after a while. But there's a sort of there's a, there's a part of me that's being disengaged so that my mind can wander in a way that I'm not listening to outside conversation or something. You know, it it sort of stimulates a certain kind of brain activity. It's a little bit like you know, uh, I don't know, being in a conversation that, that then you're going off on on a on a branch yourself. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you where I really get that is if I go to um, seminars or conferences and the conference is a little bit disappointing, the speakers are a bit disappointing, it's not as relevant or as interesting as I was expecting. I find that usually my, um, but you can't, you can't get a laptop out and start doing email. Yeah. That's just, you know, really sort of obnoxious. But if you have a notebook, I find my, my, all kinds of things start occurring to me. I, I yeah. have great ideas when someone is just droning on. Yes. Um, and, and it's I, actually quite polite to, no, to apparently yes, be jotting yes. them down, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I, so I don't have to pay any attention, but at the same time, I can't, you know, I can't check my phone. I can't, yeah. I can't check my email. Um, <laughs> so, Do you ever go to things like uh, the Battle of Ideas, which was, is a, one particular example of that, and it's quite sort of political and, and controversial. Have you heard of it? It's a... It's a sort of two-day conference. I've heard, I've heard of it. I haven't, I haven't been. I bet you've um, been to similar things yeah. anyway. The, the dynamic is you sit in the audience. I mean, I've been on a couple of panels, but most of them I'm sitting in the audience. And about by 20 minutes in, I know what question I want to ask and I'm starting to formulate in my head. And as soon as that has happened, I'm no longer capable of listening to what they're <laughs> saying. I'm just forging this iron you know, blade in my head with which to cleave their arguments into. I've realized most of the people who read my articles on the FT have the same process. They get two paragraphs in, they yeah. think of the comment or the email they want to send me. Yes. Uh, so they're, not, they're not actually capable of taking any Somebody any should write a law. There should be a, a formula for working it out. Well, Tim, listen, it's been really interesting talking to you. I would like to do this again. I think we, we agreed half an hour beforehand as a good sort of uh, chunk of, of time to, to demand of people. But if you're, if you're willing to come back and do another chapter another time. I, I'd be delighted. It'd be great. Absolutely it's, it's splendid. Lovely to see you. And you, Tim. Thank you very much. Take care. Stay safe. And do whatever the government currently believes is appropriate. <laughs>